Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this public lecture of NMML on the subject of the contribution of Sri Raman Maharshi to national awakening and to India's spiritual heritage. We have the immense pleasure of having with us today for this lecture Dr. Venkat Ramanan, who is the president of Sri Ramanashramam and the great grand nephew of the great sage of Arunachal Raman Maharshi. So I extend a very warm welcome. I extend a very warm welcome to him and thank him at the outset itself for accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture here. I can also see a lot of the followers of Sri Raman Maharshi who have joined us today and that is why we have put some extra chairs here to accommodate. So I extend a very warm welcome to them as well, sir. And it is our immense pleasure that the Honorable Chairman of NMML Executive Council, Shri Nupin Mishra ji, has also just joined us. In fact, he was, he was actually the inspiration behind this lecture. And uh, when it was organized, he had told us very clearly that he will certainly join this lecture. So I extend a very warm welcome to Honorable Chairman as well. And then again, a very warm welcome to all other members of the audience. Now about the speaker, Dr. Venkates Ramnan is the president of Sri Ramanashramam, as I said earlier. He's the great grand nephew of Sri Raman Maharshi, following in the footsteps of his great grandfather, grandfather and father, he took over as the fourth president of the ashram in 2020. Dr. Venkat is a medical doctor who received his MBBS and MD degrees from the Baroda Medical College, Gujarat. He subsequently did his residency in the United States and was a successful physician in Maryland for over 25 years. He has returned to India for good with his family to serve the Maharshi's ashram and his devotees. He is the editor of the ashram publications Mountain Path and Sharanagati. The subject of uh, today's lecture, Contribution of Sri Raman Maharshi to National Awakening and to India's Spiritual Heritage, is very important in many ways, but I will just mention one of those here, and that is that in my opinion, the national reawakening of India really probably would not have been possible without the spiritual reawakening of India, in which great uh, sages, leaders, I would say, we can start from uh, Swami Dayananda Saraswati, who was born in 1824, and whose 200th anniversary we will be celebrating very soon. So starting with Swami Dayananda Saraswati, then Swami Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, and of course, Ramana Maharshi, who was a Jeevan Mukt, but who gave the message of Purusharth to the followers and to the country. So I would say that without this spiritual reawakening of India, probably it would have been difficult for the country to achieve the nationalist reawakening. One reason this is so, I would argue, is that the British rule in India was not simply a political rule. It was also a civilizational discourse which told this country that India is civilizationally inferior to the West and therefore that civilizational challenge and hegemony which the West posed in this country had to be fought along with the political struggle which of course was fought in a very big way uh, in the 20th century. And in that, the spiritual reawakening created by people like Sri Raman Maharshi and others that I mentioned and many others whom I cannot mention here, of course, but we produced a large number of such people at various levels who created that spiritual and nationalist reawakening. So I would urge that 
spiritual and nationalist reawakening should really be seen you know as closely interrelated to each other and without them india's freedom struggle as it was led from 1920 onward the mass struggle by gandhi ji would have been difficult and one might add that gandhi ji though he was formally not a saint though there is that old debate you know of whether he was a politician who was trying to be a saint or he was a saint who was uh, in politics but the reality is that building upon the foundations of the great spiritual figures of india gandhi ji created that spiritual and moral effect upon the masses which made that mass freedom struggle possible so with these few words i once again welcome dr venkat ramanan and uh, request him to proceed with his lecture thank you sir antarya shabahi vidut timram jyotirmayam shashvatam sthanam prapye virajate vinamatam agnyanam munmulayan pashyan vishvam api tamullasati yo vishvash pare parah tasmay shri ramanaya loka guruve shokasya hantre namaha a very good afternoon to the akim uh, uh, all the at uh, blessed atmans here shri nrpendra mishra ji ravi mishra ji justice ram murthy shri batiani and all the uh, friends of ramna kendra thank you so much for being here i want to thank the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library for inviting me to deliver this lecture because this happens to be the anniv hundredth uh, centenary anniversary of the Sri Ramana Ashramam formation, and that is the ashram founded by Sri Bhagwan Sri Ramana Marshi. Friends, today I have two parts to my address, which I will. divide as separate sections and and in the end i'll try to link them together because they are all interconnected as shri mishra ji uh, said the contributions of ramana maharshi to the national awakening and the contribution of bhagwan ramana to india's spiritual legacy and heritage call jung a very famous swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst of the 30s and 40s said shri ramana is a true son of the indian earth in india he is the whitest spot in a white space what we find in life and teachings of shri ramana is the purest of india it is a chant of the millenniums the life and teachings of shri ramana are not only important for the indian but also for the westerner shri marshi was indeed a sage without the least touch of worldliness a saint of matchless purity embodiment of the eternal truth in all scriptures it is not often that a spiritual genius of the magnitude of shri ramana visits this earth but when such an event occurs the entire humanity gets benefited and a new era of hope before it opens before it devotees of shri ramana simply call him bhagwan uh, so today i will intermingle ramana maharshi with bhagwan for uh, some moving sections which are divine indeed coming to the first part his role in the national awakening bhagwan ramana maharshi came to tiruvannamalai in 1896 following a death experience he had in his home in madurai at the tender age of 16 in july 1896 on a hot summer day he felt all of a sudden that he was about to die without asking for help he calmly faced the imminent prospect of death he drove his mind inwards and realized that 
death was only limited to his physical body. Simultaneously, he felt the rising of the full force of his personality and the awakening of the Atman, I, once for all. He experienced firsthand that he was the ever-shining, deathless spirit transcending the body. Fear of death vanished once for all. The 16-year-old was thus permanently established in the self. From then on, the divine Shakti of the holy hill Arunachala took over his existence. This hill drew the young sage from Madurai to Thiruvannamalai in September 1896. From that day, the sage of Arunachala has been radiating power and grace that triggered a national awakening and a spiritual renaissance in our motherland. Friends, it's no coincidence that in December 1896, Swami Vivekananda began his return journey to India after delivering the soul-stirring speeches in Chicago, New York, and Oxford. The Ramakrishna mission was established soon after. In fact, Sri Swami Vivekananda, on his travel near Ramnad, prophesied that a spiritual revolution was going to start from this place. And of course, we are experiencing just the beginning of it. Friends, it's no coincidence that one day Matram, our national song, was publicly sung by Rabindranath Tagore for the first time in the sessions of Indian National Congress in 1896. Sri Ramana Maharshi, the silent sage, was indeed the incarnation of Lord Dakshinamurti. He taught primarily by silence and suffused spiritual strength to all. The silence that he radiated was not an ideal one, but a dynamic one of tremendous potency that pulsated and energized everyone who came in contact with it. His devotees included famous poets of that time who were part of the freedom struggle, like Subramanya Bharati, Suddhananda Bharati, Dilip Kumar Roy, Sarojini Naidu, and Harindra Nachatopadai, to name a few, who drew inspiration from him. Chief Justices and High Court Justices like Justice K. Sundaram Chettiyar, Justice N. Chandrasekhar Iyer saw in him all the characteristics of a sthitak pragna described in the Bhagavad Gita. Freedom fighters like Dr. Rajendra Prasad, Sri Jamnalal Bajaj, Manu Suvedar, Dr. Melkote, Dr. O.P. Ramaswamy Reddyar, all met him in person and had their doubts clarified and revived their spiritual batteries in his presence to continue the important job of getting the independence of the country. When a devotee asked Sri Ramana Maharshi, is not the tapasya of the ancient Mahatmas of the land available for the benefit of its present-day inheritors? He replied, quote, is it without such a saving grace that the present awakening has come into being? Bhagavan had high regard for the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi. He said, quote, Gandhiji has surrendered himself to the divine and works accordingly with no self-interest. He does not concern himself with the results, but accepts them as they turn up. That must be the attitude of all national workers. Once, a devotee read out an extract from an article that Gandhiji had written in the Harijan about a trip he took to Bhagavad, Rajkot, that explains his high spiritual state. Quote, how mysterious are the ways of God. The just journey to Rajkot is a wonder even to me. Why am I going? Whither am I going? What for? I have thought nothing about these things. And if God guides me, what should I think? Why should I think? Even thought may be an obstacle in the way of his guidance. The fact is, 
It takes no effort to stop thinking. The thoughts do not come. Indeed, there is no vacuum. But I mean to say that there is no thought about this mission. To this, Ramana Maharshi remarked how true the words were and emphasized each statement in the extract. Sorry. Gandhiji had the highest respect for the Maharshi. Whenever someone in a circle, like Shankarlal Banker, Rajendra Prasad, or Jamnalal Bajaj, felt depressed or confused, he would tell them, go to Ramanashramam and come back after a month's stay there. Usually, they came back within a week or fortnight, recovered in spirit and ready to resume their nation-building activities. When Dr. Rajendra Prasad once met him in Sabarmati Ashram, requesting some time off from the hectic life of a freedom fighter, Gandhiji said, if you want peace, go to Ramnashramam and remain there for a few days in the presence of Sri Ramana Maharshi, but without asking, without talking or asking any questions, he added. Gandhiji said, uh, this was the instruction to Rajinder Prasad. Rajinder Prasad accordingly arrived at Sri Ramnashramam on 14th August 1938 and spent a week there in the presence of Bhagwan. And at the time of his taking leave, he said, Oh Master, it, is Gandhiji, it was Gandhiji himself who sent me here. Is there any message that I may take to him, back to him? To this Ramana gra graciously answered, Adhyatma Shakti, the primordial power of the self, is working within him that is Gandhiji, and leading him on. That is enough. What more is necessary? The same power which works here is working there also. Where is the need of for words when heart speaks to heart? End of quote. On a lighter note, Sarojini Naidu, the poetess, remarked, the two Mahans, the Maharshi who gives us peace, and Mahatma, who does not let us rest one moment in peace, were both working for the spiritual regeneration of India." End of quote. When a devotee came to Bhagwan, asked if he could join Gandhiji in his 21-day fast in Yarwada jail, Ramna smiled and said, it's a good sign that you have such feelings, but what can you do now? Get the strength which Gandhiji has already got by his tapasya. You will afterwards succeed. Now, this is a crucial point. Ramana was categorical that one has first to build spiritual strength enough for karma yoga to bear fruit. According to Professor Swaminathan, the former chief editor of Collected Works, of Mahatma Gandhi and the great Ramana Bhakta. Providence kept these two spiritual genes away from meeting in person on purpose so that the national independence could be achieved. Ramana is the spiritual son and Mahatma Gandhi ji was the gentle moon providing solis to the masses. As the moon would melt in the sun's presence, they were kept apart from one another by nature so that the independence could come about. Mahatma Gandhi never failed to remark Sri Ramanashramam Idlis whenever he saw one. It was his way of remembering the Maharshi and his ideals on a constant basis. Prince, the national flag was meticulously made with Khadi cloth in Ramanashramam on the eve of Independence Day with Sri Ramana Maharshi drawing the Ashoka Chakra in the center of the flag and coloring it himself. The next day, there was flag hoisting in the ashram supervised by the Maharshi. And this tradition continues to this day in the ashram. So I invite any of you visiting that area.
to uh, celebrate uh, August 15th with us. Similarly, friends, many spiritual leaders who were instrumental in rejuvenating and in preserving the spiritual legacy and the heritage of Bharat, the nation, were blessed by the sage of Arunachala. Swami Chinmayananda, who met Ramana Maharshi at the age of 16, recounts of his meeting with Ramana Maharshi. Quote, after my college days, my political work, and after my days of stay in Uttarkashi, at the feet of my master, Tapovanam, I knew that what I gained on the Ganges banks was that which had been given to me years before by the saint of Thiruvannamalai on that hot summer day by a mere look. Swami Tapovan Maharaj, Swami Chinmayananda's guru, was also blessed to meet Ramana Maharshi as a teenager. His words, Maharshi was the idol of peace and silence. It is the duty of all those who admire and follow him to seek after that divine silence. The inquiry of that divine silence is nothing but the inquiry, who am I? O man, inquire and be immersed in that inner silence. Do all the work of this world to reach that goal, to attain that divine silence. Swami Rajeshwaranda of Ramakrishna Mission also said, the gospel that Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi gave unto the world is a divine legacy left to mankind to be delivered from generation to generation. It solves the problems of mankind by the dynamic emphasis on the divinity of the man. It moves all nations, all races, and the whole world to the one and the only one self. Amongst other spiritual leaders, blessed to be in his presence included Swami Sivananda, Swami Chidananda of Divine Life Society, Swami Muktananda of Ganeshpuri, Swami Ramdas of Kanchangad. Bhagavan Ramana, by inspiring such stalwarts who were engaged in national awakening by his life and his teachings, elevated them to the highest dimension of a state beyond the limitations of the human mind. This infusion of spiritual energy brought about fortitude and forbearance in these leaders in their fight against the colonizers of our Bharat Mata resulting in the nation winning its independence from their tyranny by non-violent means. Friends, I don't think any independence, any fight has been won by non-violent means ever before. Now, I'm, I'm gonna to come to the second part of my address, contribution of Sri Ramana Maharshi to India's spiritual legacy and heritage. Sri Ramana Maharshi's greatest contributions to Indian legacy and heritage is the restoration and the adaptation of the ancient path of Atma Vichara or self-inquiry to the modern conditions. In ancient times, it had been a path reserved for the heroic few who could strive in solitude, withdrawn from the world in constant meditation. As might be expected, the practice therefore became increasingly rare over time. What Bhagavan Ramana did was to restore it in a new form combined with Karma Yoga in such a way that it could be used in the conditions of the modern world. Since it requires no ritual or outer forms of worship, it is in fact the ideal method for the need of our times. He revived Jnana Yoga by lifting it out of a particular religion which had engendered it and making it accessible to men of all religions. If Ramakrishna was like Darwin, Sri Ramana is like Einstein. If Ramakrishna summed up and recapitulated the whole organic evaluation, evolution of human spirituality, Ramana Maharshi, as like a scientific discoverer, 
discovered himself, explored Devo, the deeper dimensions of reality, and perfected us for us uh, the technique of self-inquiry, Atma Vichara, with which others can repeat his experiment and verify his findings by their own direct experience. Sri Ramana is typical a power of Tamil culture with its rigorous intellectual precision as Sri Ramakrishna is of Bengali culture with its emotional warmth and Mahatma Gandhi of Gujarati culture with its brisk down-to-earth practicality. The Jeevan Mukta's detached presence in the world serves a very important lessons for us who are on this side of Maya. It provides for us the point of contact between the Paramartika and Vyavaharika world. It presents to us the experience of oneness of all selves in awareness and convinces us of its practical possibility. It shows us all that the dream is in the dreamer and not the dreamer is in the dream. Any amount of action can be performed and quite well by the jnani without his identifying with it in any way or even imagining he is the doer. Some power acts through his body to get the work done. The Jivan Mukta continues to live in our midst as awareness, as the person in all persons. He lives in all and as all, as all life. In the words of Kapali Shastri, the Maharshi is unique in the history of world's saints. To have lived for full 54 years after realization, to have influenced so many from his seat in one place, to have been accessible to all at all hours is something unprecedented. Kanchi Paramacharya said, no religion spreads because of its doctrines. People do not care much for doctrine. But when there appears a man of outstanding goodness in life and conduct, filled with compassion of tranquility, people trust him the moment they set eyes on him. They accept his teaching because they are convinced that doctrines upheld by such a man must be sound. On the other hand, a doctrine, however sound, or true has no appeal to common people if its advocates fail in conduct. Bhagavan spread this doctrine by living it, by embodying it in every worldly deed of his. In the words of philosophy, professor of philosophy of Allahabad University, Dr. Hafiz Syed, an ardent devotee, quote, his plain and unsophisticated philosophy reflected in his day-to-day -day conduct, serves as a key to unlock the system of life and solves in a practical way the complicated social, political, religious, and economic problems that confront us today. The sage of Arunachala, however, is not a dogmatic teacher, nor a religious propagandist or a reformer. He is really a spiritual scientist who has adopted the scientific method of approaching the truth by investigating the realm of the unknown with the aid of his intuitive genius, which has assimilated reason. Friends, a modern scientist discovers a certain truth, not only for himself, but for the benefit of the whole mankind, irrespective of any race or nationality. He shares the knowledge Willing, willingly with everyone. Sri Maharshi similarly hands over the res his research to the world in order that the torch of spiritual enlightenment be kept burning from one generation to another. I'll try to briefly explain Atma Vichara. The core teaching of Vedanta is that we are all pure consciousness, Satchitananda. 
but because we limit ourselves by identifying ourselves with our body and mind in error, we are limited. The root cause of this error is our ego. Bhagavan taught us that ego is nothing but a bundle of thoughts, at the root of which is the I thought. In deep sleep, when we are egoless, we, there is bliss and harmony. Even the greatest tragedy or pain cannot touch us in that blessed state. The moment we wake up, the first thought that springs up is the I thought. From there on, for example, I will identify I'm Dr. Ramanan, flood of thoughts take over me, I'm in Delhi, I'm, I have to give a speech uh, today and so on. However, what is common to all these thoughts is the I thought. So Ramana simply tells us to get to the core, to this core thought, and to strip it of all its association with adjuncts. Once that is done, he asks her to trace what remains, which is the pure I thought, to its source, the Hridayam, on the uh, the spiritual heart center, the seat of unalloyed bliss and peace. In a book, Ramana Gita, to where he addresses questions to the great saint Kavya Kanta Ganapati Muni, chapter 5, Hridaya Vidya, Ramana says, the heart referred is not the physical organ on the left, but the self which is conceived is located on the right side of the heart. This is the source from where the I thought and all other thoughts arise. The whole universe is in the body and the whole body is in the heart. Hence, all the universe is contained in this heart. As the sun gives light to the moon, even so, this heart gives light to the mind. A mortal absent from the heart perceives only the mind just as the light of the moon is perceived at night in the absence of the sun. Not perceiving that the true source of light is one's own self and mentally perceiving objects as apart from himself, the ignorant one is denuded. The jnani, ever present in the heart, sees the light of the mind merged in the light of the heart, like the moonlight in the daylight. The notion that the seer is different from the seen is only in the mind. For those who abide in the heart, the seer and the seen are one. As Ramana explained to Kavya Kanta, if one watches where the notion of I arises, the mind is absorbed into that. That is tapas. When a mantra is repeated, if one watches the source from which the mantra sound is produced, the mind is absorbed in that. That is tapas. So practically, say if I am agitated about something or someone, the practice of Atma Pichara is to catch myself from falling into a deeper state of agitation by asking, who is, it, who is it that is getting agitated? Then the answer will come to me. Then I should ask, who is this me? Who is this I? Then we are, by at the same time reminding myself that I am the pure consciousness, I am not the mind or this body. Then I, we are taken back to the pure I thought and then to the spiritual heart, the Hridayam. So we are able to get a spiritual solution instead of letting the agitation overpower us. Friends, frequent practice of this Atma Vichara will help everyone to stay in control of one's thoughts and deal with life's vicissitudes with calmness and poise whether the body is engaged in talking, reading, or anything else, we should not lose focus on the pure eye. Keep it at the center of our attention all times, in the background. The beauty of this method is that it can be practiced anywhere and under all, any situation, quietly and unobtrusively. 
No external rituals are needed. People around us need not even know that we are practicing self-inquiry. What they will see is the result of the practice, the fruit of the practice, the efficiency and the calmness in us. The practice can thus be part of any karma we are engaged in. That is why Bhagwan Ramana never encouraged anyone to give up life in the world. He explained that giving up would only exchange the thought, I am a householder, for the thought, I am a sannyasin. Whereas what is necessary is to reject the I am the doer completely and remember only I am. This approach can be done by means of vichara equally while in New Delhi as well as in Arunachala. It can be done in a city or in the forest. The declaration that renunciation of the sense of viewership is the only true renunciation offers the greatest solace to seekers and makes India's highest philosophy accessible to peoples from all walks of life. So many have explained Vedanta over ages, but only Bhagavan Ramana presented the essence in the clearest and the succinct manner. He thus brought fresh life to Vedanta and showed that this is a path this path is not a theoretical, abstract philosophy, but, but is the most practical world to lead a harmonious life, even in the external world. He never encouraged anyone to give up performing duties, discharge of karma in this world. He advised the devotees to give up the I am the doer attitude and not to be attached to the results of their action. He quotes Yoga Vashishta to even make it a, a very happy, playful episode. As Saint Vashishta advises Rama in Yoga Vashishta, quote, holding firmly at heart to the truth of your being, play play like a hero your part on the world stage, inwardly calm and detached, but assuming zeal and joy, initiative and effort, and performing outward actions appropriate to your particular role in various situations. The quest for self-realization, serious mumukshutva, goes hand in hand with the performance of bold, heroic action in the world. In the practice of dharma, outward action, there is no difference between the seeker and the realized person. Sri Ramana Maharshi demonstrated this through his own life. In the 54 years that he lived in Thiruvannamalai, he showed how a pure nani, jnani can lead a normal life in the midst of people without losing sight of who he is in reality, he is Brahman or the Self. We read about such jnanis in our Puranas and epics, but for us, Bhagwan Ramana lived like those rishis of the Yor. Sincere aspirants were drawn to him from all over the world. Women, men, scholars, peasants, rich, poor, even animals and birds. An Acharya, uh, recently whom I met, who is involved in the G20, um, said, Vasudeva Kutambam can be explained in two words. In two words, Ramana Maharshi. So, but Ramana Maharshi revered Arunachala, the holy hill, true to our Hindu heritage of treating all land and water sacred. His presence can be felt to this day. In fact, it is felt with greater intensity than when he was in the body. As being in the ashram, I meet seekers of all ethnic backgrounds from all over India and world every day in the ashram. This includes people from Syria, Turkey, Israel, China, and all parts of India. Our ashram has peacocks, cows, monkeys, and dogs cohabitating naturally with humans and also has the richest flora and fauna 
as devotees say, it is like the Panchavati of Ramayana. This is the spiritual heritage of Bhagavan Ramana. Following Bhagavan's teachings, even partially, offers immense solace and comfort. He lives through his teachings and is eternally here as the inner guru for all sincere seekers. Friends, I'll begin to conclude. Sri Ramana Maharshi made significant contributions to both national awakening and India's spiritual heritage. Some key aspects to of his contributions include spiritual awakening. Sri Ramana Maharshi's teachings and presence played a crucial role in the spiritual awakening of many individuals. His emphasis on self-inquiry and direct experience of one's true nature resonated with seekers from various backgrounds. Through his teachings, he inspired countless individuals to explore their inner selves and attain spiritual liberation. Number two, Advaita Vedanta. Ramana Maharshi's teachings born out of his own direct experience are deeply rooted in Advaita Vedanta, a philosophy that emphasizes the non-dual nature of reality. He helped revive the practice of this ancient philosophical tradition. His teachings continue to influence scholars, teachers, seekers worldwide. Universality of his message. Sri Ramana, Ramana, Ramana Maharshi's teachings transcend religion and cultural boundaries. He emphasized the unity of all religions and the universal nature of spiritual realization. His teachings promote love, compassion, and understanding, fostering a sense of unity and harmony amongst individuals from different backgrounds. For, for friends, we are all nothing but the Atman. Number four, establishment of Sri Ramana Ashramam. The ashram that Sri Ramana Marsh, that I would say established around him, for he had no sankalpa. It just came about. So this ashram established in the town of Thiruvannamalai is a spiritual hub attracting speak seekers from all over the world. The ashram, nourished to this day by his living presence, increasingly continues to serve as a center for spiritual practice, study, and contemplation. Written works. Sri Ramana Maharshi's teachings have been saved for posterity as written works. They have been translated into various Indian and world languages and have been instrumented in spreading his teachings by making them accessible to any genuine seeker anywhere in the world. Friends, last year, over people from over 120 countries visited Ramana Ashramam, and this is without any propaganda. So as, as the teachings say, when the disciple is ready, the master appears before him or her. Influence on spiritual teachers. Ramana Maharshi's teachings have had a profound influence on many spiritual teachers and leaders. His teachings continue to inspire and guide spiritual seekers, both in India and abroad. Albert Einstein said of Mahatma Gandhi, generations to come will scarce believe that such one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. Similarly, we have read about great rishis in Srimad Bhagavatam, other scriptures, but here was one who walked upon this earth in flesh and blood as recently as the 20th century. Now, truly, this is the conclusion. This is the era of AI, which we know artificial intelligence. It's summarized as AI. All conversations revol re revolves around AI. In the same vein, I will conclude with an AI reference with your permission. The topic of today's topic is contribution of Ramana Maharshi to national awakening and to India's spiritual heritage. For this, I will say AI, Arunachala and India. This summarizes his contribution to national awakening, nation building. 
for the spiritual movement that began by his coming to Arunachala in India is just continuing to do all this. Similar, the, the other AI is Atma Gyan and Pure Eye Consciousness AI. Summarizes his contributions to India's spiritual heritage. May we all strive towards this AI attaining Atma Gyan and Pure Eye Universal Consciousness by shedding our limited egos is my prayer today. Friends, thank you for your kind attention. Om Namo Bhagavad Gita. This has been such an absolutely enlightening lecture on the subject of Raman Maharshi and the connection between the national awakening and the spiritual heritage of India. I uh, sincerely thank Dr. Venkat Ramnan for accepting our invitation and for enlightening us on this subject. Um, um, we are now open uh, for uh, questions and comments. Let's uh, try to be brief. So, uh, the, yeah. So, first of all, uh, you know, the uh, first is to get a, the, get a theoretical understanding by, uh, you know, there's a simple booklet uh, in, of 16 pages in which Ramana Maharshi, as a uh, young sage of 21 years, explained uh, the, the core of the teachings. So, we can start with the theoretical understanding. So. Coming to the whole thing, this is a, the theory is a very s simple and abstract, but the practice is what is important. The whole emphasis is on practice. So as, a, as I explained in the talk, is, the, for, is to kill the thoughts. The, the, first, the, the killing of the ego, the manu nasha, is, is when is the most important thing. And by killing the man, uh, manas, we don't become a blank, we don't become uh, an unintelligent person. In fact, we become a, a, a supra-intelligent person because it's the mind, which is the bundle of thoughts, which is constantly talking in the back that prevents us from doing any activity in the full force. So what Ramana Maharshi says is, but you know, initially it will appear like it's too much work, but whenever a thought comes, instead of giving it life and uh, idea, you have to say, say suppose, oh, uh, 5 o'clock, I have to catch a bus, bus will go, then I won't, next bus comes at 5.30, something like that. The next thing you know, there'll be 100 thoughts uh, leading to the thing. So kill it at the first thought by saying, to whom is this thought coming? And then, you know, then it'll, you know, if it, but it's not to keep on answering, but it's to say, that'll refocus you away from the thought on your pure I, the Atman, in the background. So by reducing the number of thoughts, you know, there's, uh, you know, only Westerners can do. So one person counted that there are random 42,000 thoughts in a day. I don't know how they did it. But even if you reduce it to, say, 20,000, imagine how fresh would you feel. So half your activities you would have done without your thought being in the background. You know, it's in, a, in, in this room I'm answering to you. If everybody speaks, you can't hear what I'm clearly saying. But because, so by reducing the number of background thoughts, you're very clear. And then you can do the thought, the, you know, your action goes on. At the same time, by reducing the, the thoughts, the ego gets weaker and weaker. So once the ego gets weaker, the what is there, we all are nothing but the Atman. The same Atman is there. The spark of divinity is in all of us. So, but what is what the thoughts are doing is it is covering us by taking us away from our pure Atman. So, this what Ramana says is it's a instead of an external journey, this is an internal journey. So, you are going towards the Atman, and then there he says other 
things also help. Like if you do ka karma without expecting results, it will also lead you further on this path. Then bhakti, bhakti marga also helps, you know, that way. But, but the beauty of bhakti marga is, in again, see, when you're in a temple, when you're, or wherever, any place of worship, instead of thinking about, oh, the weather is bad, this, you're thinking of that divine thing. So again, you know, so as, this, as he says, meditation is nothing but th sticking to one thought. And that's why meditation keeps you so fresh and pure. So that you can do it naturally too. You don't have to uh, shut yourself in your house, in your room. Of course, he says, but some spiritual practices do help. So like meditation in the morning initially and before going to bed, again, uh, improves your focus. So that, but the eventual uh, thing is, uh, all these other margas are only a uh, way towards jnana marga. The highest marga is jnana marga. All the other bhakti, karma, uh, yoga mark are all only to make you stronger, to make your mind stronger so that it can go towards the Atman. So uh, I hope... Yeah. Uh, I didn't confuse you much. No. Please okay. raise your hands yeah. if you want to ask a question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also yeah. Well, but I say, so start. Start with who am I? Yeah. Start with who am I? The booklet. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for your uh, elucid uh, talk. But I would like to ask you one question. Yes. If we are so rich and enlightened on most of the subject. Yes. Still, we are not able to produce scientists. Just give me one minute more. Yes. We are not, we have been, uh, for 1200 years, we have been under various, you know, occupancy of other countries. And uh, we are still not able to uh, get to the top of the world. Even if you think we are so rich, why we are not? You know, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that um, uh, I left India in 1994, and I'm back here. This is not the India I left. It's like, I would say, almost like United States. If we continue the way India is progressing, we'll soon catch up. Uh, uh, frankly, I don't miss uh, America at all. You know, the way India is progressing, and probably the way the other countries maybe are falling. But coming back to you, uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, I'm not a political scientist, but the colonizing uh, effect is more here. Because if you, you know, I'll give you a simple example. In uh, America, uh, I was a physician. 15%, we are Indians are 2% of the population, but 15% of all physicians. and. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, if, if uh, the hospitals will shut down if uh, Indians don't show up, you know, surgeries won't happen or research won't happen in many places. Our, our children or the next generation are all phenomenal scientists, entrepreneurs over there. I think um, I would argue that because we lost our spiritual strength, our backbone, we have been, uh, we are not proud and I think we are not, we are not confident in the experiments. We are not confident. I think it's only a question of time, sir, that science and all are going to come back to India. Because without spiritual strength, you know, they, as they say, in sports they say, don't play to your opponent's strength, play to your strength. So I think it's time we went back to our spiritual strength and, and by that, we will uh, reawaken our uh, scientific. Because I went to America and I did reasonably well. I know that I don't think America did anything. You know, I think it is all my teachers here and everybody, all our uh, you know uh, schoolmates, and uh, they all uh, you know encourage us to grow. And uh, so we 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 don't realize it because. I think it's too many intelligent people in one place. I think that we drag each other down, you know. So I think uh, 
but i think it's only a question of time before we start seeing that's the most, most original uh, explanation one might have heard you know <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah other questions please i was uh, yeah i was uh, uh, i'm glad uh, that you come here and you know given a uh, a brief about you know Ramana Maharshi and uh, this thing, but I was uh, in Ramana Ashram. Uh, we had taken a, we were a group of about eight people. We went uh, uh, in December, and thanks to you, we got the accommodation at the ashram. Thank you. And uh, I must say that you know there is a divinity about the place, yes. and 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 also uh, the entire uh, complex, you know, which has various activities. The, uh, you know Ramana's uh, teachings. You know, in the evening somebody talks about his writings, and uh, you know, there's in both in English and Tamil, and also the library, where you know, the one week that I stayed there, I read the book of uh, you know Paul Brunton, yes. who was very close to uh, Ramana Maharshi at the time, and he'd written it in a beautiful way. You know, and I explained about uh, the uh, features of uh, Ramana Maharshi, Ramana Maharshi, and then you know, you can see the feel of it. You know. And, and finish the book, you know, mm. that one week th there, and and also the parikrama, you know, is yes. very. It gives the uh, divinity to us, and we have to get involved, you know, more. And somebody says, you know, we we're all we're all in the materialistic uh, world, and to get to spiritual uh, thing, it will take time, and and slowly, slowly, when you get involved, if you read books, you know, it happens. So that's Thank what you. I want to assure other people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Other questions. Yes, please. Please use the mic. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bhupinder from IIT Delhi. And I just want to make a comment that um, for young students, his teachings make a lot of sense. And uh, making these teachings available itself, uh, by itself, is very satisfying. So I just want to simply make that comment that even today, his teachings are relevant to young people, no, not just to people who are thinking of seeking spiritual um, guidance or uh, attainment towards the later part of their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, that you came all the way from Tiruvannamalai to uh, address us all in this uh, occasion. And I would like to uh, reinforce several aspects that I liked about your uh, address. The first one being uh, ashramam was built around him. He was not the founder of the ashram. He didn't move an inch from where he was and it was just pure unadulterated Vedantic knowledge that he expounded that to, with, through silence that it attracted everyone from around the world to his place. And I really liked the quote that you mentioned about, uh, I mean, the reference to Carl Jung, the great uh, psychotherapist. And I would like to add one more of his, which uh, he says, uh, probably he is the only uh, sane person in the world. He says that often. He, uh, because he is so untouched by any of the uh, physical, emotional, mental conditioning, like what if today I lose my job, I lose my sanity, I lose my memory, all my organs are transplanted, then w what will be my identity? That is, uh, to, to a person who asked where to begin, uh, who are my uh, self-inquiry, probably you can start by asking these questions to yourself. What if you lose all of your memory today? Thank you, thank you. So that people, is the kind lose, of... People do lose their memory, of course, not suddenly, most <laughs> of them, but so, over the period of time. Uh, no, no, memory is just one facet of it. Yes, I'm yes. just asked... Uh, 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 yeah, that, so that is... Uh, thanks a lot for uh, bringing in so many uh, very nice references. Thank you. <coughs> yes, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. All right. So we'll wait for the questions from the audience. A couple of things of uh, my own. <coughs> um, I'm really delighted that you have built upon this connection between the a spiritual heritage and awakening of India on the one hand, and uh, 
the nationalist or national awakening because as i said at the beginning there is of course a deep connection between the two and as i had just alluded to in the beginning that gandhi sort of built upon the spiritual foundations of the awakening which was done by the great masters and brought it to the masses so i'm delighted of course people uh, who have studied uh, gandhi well or who know about raman maharshi well are aware of the deep connection between the two and as you rightly said there was a purpose of destiny because of which probably the two never met because their margas were different so gandhi was a spiritually enlightened person you know who had great uh, adhyatmik and atma shakti in fact i would say that he was a rare person in that his atma shakti was the strength on which india's mass freedom struggle was built upon it is not as if other leaders did not have atma shakti but gandhi was the very essence and quintessence of it because it was built on you know as you said raman maharshi said on the on the tapasya of on the on the spiritual awakening that had taken place in him over the decades in south africa and then of course in india it was because of that that he could do this and of course uh, uh, raman maharshi could could see this that what raman maharshi was doing in the spiritual field you know as a jeevan mukta gandhi ji was doing in the political field so in a sense it was uh, uh, you know it was a symbiotic relationship because you needed a mass leader who yeah. could communicate to the masses about the about the spiritual heritage and the spiritual values of this great land this great civilization because as we know the words of uh, saints etc you know uh, they require that sort of uh, communication from others for them to reach the wider audience and so i would say that it is not uh, just a coincidence as you rightly said that the two yeah. existed around the same time of course shri raman maharshi was about 10 years younger than gandhi and of course he lived for 2 3 years more but if you look at it roughly their uh, their period of activity was the same yeah. starting from uh, early 20th century to about the middle of the 20th century so this is just a comment i'm glad that you have built up on it because this is something that is often uh, lost upon people because they think that it was simply a political thing a political movement or a political struggle that was required to liberate india but i would say that india's liberation was as much a spiritual uh, liberation as it was a political liberation in which uh, shri raman maharshi of course along with other yes. great masters yeah. and gandhi ji uh, in a way uh, worked together and this uh, uh, you know what uh, raman maharshi said that karma yoga is actually not possible without first building its spiritual strength yes. this i would say was best exemplified by the life of gandhi though many other people including uh, tilak had you know uh, uh, they had walked on the same path but uh, gandhi of all the others he was able to do it because as you rightly said according to shri raman maharshi it was uh, uh, while the gyan yog is the apex of it all all the other yogas the bhakti yog and the karma yog are in a way equally uh, required uh, would you like to elaborate or say anything yeah it's yeah yeah and the other important thing that uh, you know i just uh, jotted down that you have mentioned is and i think this is one of the greatest messages from the life of raman maharshi to which i had alluded at the beginning that he was a jeevan mukt who gave the message of purusharth because as gandhi ji also used to say that my place is not in a cave in the himalayas my place is in this world now so raman maharshi ji is a 
is a unique case, as you said, of somebody who achieved a spiritual enlightenment at a very young age. Yeah. Usually, it, uh, you know, yes, it, yeah. in the in the, in the history of Indian civilization, we notice that it comes at a at a at a fairly advanced stage of one's life. But of course, there are some examples of that sort. But in the case of Sri Ramar Maharshi, one can definitely say that obviously it was his, his uh, uh, Purva Purnya which uh, brought that kind of uh, deep spiritual experience to him at the young age of 16 because as, uh, uh, as the Indian culture civilization believes the sanskars never die, they, they pass on uh, by, you know, uh, from one birth to another, that's the teaching of uh, uh, Gautam Buddha also and obviously uh, given certain circumstances these uh, you know, get awakened at an opportune moment so that is uh, what happened uh, and the the last important thing which I can uh, see from uh, you know from your conversation, which I can conclude is that uh, a pure jnana yogi, there, uh, therefore, somebody who has achieved the real jnana, always connects to the world, remains connected to the world, and tries to make the world better. Because of what little I know about uh, Sri Raman Maharshi, he took continue though he remained located in uh, Arunachala, he took great interest in the lives of those who came to his ashram, yes. including from what I remember the lives of the animals which the tradition uh, mm -hmm. of course uh, you have uh, continued with. Yes. So and uh, lastly uh, as you have emphasized that one of the main messages of Sri Raman Maharshi's life was that in essence all religions teach the same thing. So there is an essential unity of all religions of the world, their paths may be different, which is of course one of the greatest uh, spiritual, moral, ethical and also political I would say messages given by the Indian culture and civilization Ekam Satya Vipra Vahuda Vadanti. Now this of course uh, you might say was also manifested in India's freedom struggle. Its inclusiveness, uh, the leadership by Gandhi of course uh, presented a quintessential sort of you know uh, struggle in which everybody was sought to be brought together and not just people belonging to different religions but different creeds and uh, other kind of beliefs which may not be described as religion. So this was one of the greatest uh, achievements of uh, Sri Raman Maharshi. Of course Sri Raman Maharshi was one of those uh, about whom we can never say enough. But I am uh, glad there don't seem to be any further questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, I will just come for the, for the simple reason that for the simple reason that you have spoken so well both uh, as, uh, as, a, as a great grand nephew of Sri Raman Maharshi and as somebody who has decided to uh, dedicate his uh, life to uh, perpetuating and disseminating his memory. Uh, so all or if not all, most of the questions that people may have had have already been answered. So on this note, I think if somebody is still has a question, we have tea and we can, uh, of course, uh, I'm sure you are going to be here with us. And uh, this is a discussion that is never ending. So obviously we will continue the discussion over a cup of tea. But on this note, I would uh, once again like to, uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Venkat S. Ramanan for accepting our invitation and delivering this absolutely enlightening lecture. And I also thank all followers of uh, Sri Raman Maharshi for joining us today and all other members, distinguished members and all others of the audience for being with us today. And now I would also like to invite everyone for a cup of tea just outside. Thank you. Thank you.